Hey team, Andre from High Performance Academy here. Welcome to another one of our webinars. Uh, today we're going to be diving into histograms, what they are and why they are so useful. And we're trying to analyze a large amount of data and I use these a huge amount, particularly with anything that I'm reflashing using HP tuners. Uh, but this is also more widely available in other products such as Mega Log Viewer HD. So we'll have a look at both examples as, as we move through today's lesson. But before before we get into the lesson, uh, just a bit of an update on what's been going on around the shop and we've been a little bit quiet over here in New Zealand, unfortunately we have had another lockdown here thanks to the Delta variant of COVID, so uh, we are just coming out the other end of that, so it's been a quiet over the last few weeks where we really haven't been allowed to get into the workshop, so a little bit frustrating, uh, but what that has meant is that we are now a month away from the first round of our injury endurance race series. Our first couple of rounds have been uh, rescheduled because they fell during our COVID lockdown. So uh, it's full steam ahead on our SR86 and I'll just update you on a couple of aspects of that. So if we jump across to my laptop screen, uh, this is just a bit of a shot of something that Brandon's been working on which is this little electrical interface box here for our coils. Uh, and we've got a set of IGN1A coils we originally had a different coil system on this uh, which was the R35 coil packs. Uh, we went away from that because while there's nothing wrong with the R35 coil packs themselves, they're very, very well proven in high horsepower applications. The actual integration with the uh, the P11 Primera rocker cover for a race application just really wasn't up to task. Uh, it was a little bit fiddly and very difficult to quickly and easily remove and reinstall the coil. So we went the way of the IGN1A coil, which is obviously, again, really well proven. So uh, this is just integrating them with the existing wiring. And uh, Brandon's been busy uh, with finishing up the harness that goes between uh, that little interface box and the actual coils themselves which is what we can see here. Uh, so these are actually sealed, there's a back shell on the IGN 1A uh, coil and a Raycam heat moulded boot there just to seal them as well as possible and you can see a little syringe there in the background and uh, no Brandon doesn't have a drug habit that is actually for the epoxy that we use for sealing those boots so uh, just part of the wiring going on there uh, and now another thing that uh, we have wanted to get into the car uh, for this season of racing is a proper fire extinguisher system so uh, this is obviously just a safety safety sort of backstop for us in case something does go wrong uh, we obviously want the best but unfortunately the, the there is always the potential for something to go wrong so plan for the best and uh, sorry hope for the best plan for the worst is kind of uh, our strategy here so this is a lifeline fire extinguisher system we can see a couple of these little nozzles here basically we can we've got these mounted in both the cabin uh, to protect the driver as well as in the engine bay and sort of generally situating them in a place where uh, we're likely to potentially expect fire somewhere around the fuel system System, uh, around the turbocharger as well so uh, those are mounted there and all plumb now and this is the fire extinguisher system that's mounted in behind the driver's seat and I mean a fire extinguisher, a portable fire extinguisher is a requirement for any race car here in New Zealand. Uh, the problem is if you've ever actually seen someone try to put out a fire with a handheld fire extinguisher, uh, it's really actually quite amazing just how little impact they'll have on a reasonable size fire. So uh, the more fire extinguisher we can get into the car, the better as far as we're concerned. Uh, if nothing else, uh, even with a minor fire, it can do a lot of damage So the ability to put that out quickly. Uh, and minimize the damage to the car that's worthwhile in my book so looks like we should be pretty well set up on that front uh, now another thing that's been going on uh, or about to go into the car is uh, a set of air jacks and uh, while personally I've always uh, been pretty uh, keen on getting a set of air jacks into a race car just because of watching professional motorsport over the years uh, there is a practical element to having these as well uh, with the aero body kit or aero parts that we've got on the car particularly the front 
front splitter and the rear diffuser. What that does is it makes it very, very difficult now for us to quickly and easily jack the car up uh, in order to perform a wheel change or something like that. So while, yes, it can be done, if we want to change from, a, let's say, a slick to a wet uh, during a race, uh, trying to change all four using a manual jack is going to be incredibly time-consuming. So uh, we've got these going in, and these will all be plumbed into the car. Now, uh, that in itself creates another hurdle, though, because uh, what that means is it's quite difficult to actually work underneath the car just on the air jacks. Uh, and this is because they obviously only jack the car off the ground far enough to actually uh, change a wheel. So they're going to get the wheels in there, but that's about it. And uh, if we jump across to my laptop screen here, we've got this rather elaborate looking setup here, uh, which can be used to jack the car higher. So uh, basically, this is two piece. We've got this a little top section here, which can be slid in uh, under the air jacks on their own uh, to basically prevent the jacks from retracting if the air supply was removed or something. And this is essential if you're going to do any work under the car just to protect the mechanic who's there. Uh, this bottom section though, this is what we can use to actually allow the car to be lifted in two steps. So basically it's slid in. Uh, you can see this little aluminium slider here. So originally uh, that would be in the out position. Uh, we have the car on the air jacks, we put this in position and then we retract the air jacks. So then basically the car is sitting on this black section here. Uh, what we can then do is slide that little silver slider in into the position it's in there. That gives us another stand, jack the car up again and it raises it basically two steps in the air. So uh, pretty handy if we are going to be doing something like uh, changing a transmission or essentially doing anything under the car. So uh, a little bit of work to go but uh, we have got just under a month so pretty confident that we're going to be in a pretty good place come the start of this season definitely uh, we're a lot better off than we were at this time last year with a car that has been relatively well proven shaken down seems to be pretty quick and uh, fingers crossed so far uh, reasonably reliable but we know what motorsport is like and we aren't taking anything for granted uh, and as usual we'll keep you in the loop with what's going on as we progress now I did touch on this briefly last time we had one of these webinars but I just want to talk about it in a little bit more detail. So if we jump across to my laptop screen here, it's some data from uh, the a shakedown race that we did at Teratonga Park Raceway which is about two hours south of where we are in Queenstown. We went and did a little uh, club day sprint and uh, just basically got a chance to get some more track time at one of the tracks that we will be racing at in the Endurance Series. And the data that we've got here uh, at the top is our damper position. So we have had the chance to get a set of four damper uh, pots onto the car. So these monitor the damper position and allows that to be logged. In its own right, this is useful to a point. We've used this with some coast down tests to get a bit of a sense of how much downforce we're getting from the rear wing and the front splitter, uh, rear diffuser, etc. Basically what we're looking at there is a static ride height when the car is stationary and then we do a coast down test where we'll get the car up to around 200 kilometers an hour, 120 odd mile an hour and then clutch in and allow the car to coast and obviously at higher speed the, the downforce from the aero kit uh, will reduce the ride height. So it gives us a bit of an ability to at least get a sense of what the downforce is as well as the balance front to rear. Uh, the other aspect with this is it can be used to help actually tune our bump and rebound damping and uh, that is through our suspension histogram. So uh, basically by monitoring the suspension position over time uh, the velocity of the damper can be calculated actually that's done here and then the Motec i2 data analysis uh, software then allows us to demonstrate this or display them in a histogram. Uh, so what this is looking at is the bump and rebound uh, rates and the percentage of time that they are in different bins here so if we look at the across the top left here uh, we've got our rebound which is what I've just circled low speed and high speed. Now this isn't to do with the speed of the car, this is to do with the speed of the damper and basically we split this into sometimes low, medium and high speed uh, damper position or damper velocity and what we're looking at there is low speed is the sort of areas where we're looking at driver input so when we turn the steering wheel and the car will sort of turn into a corner and start to body roll, uh, that sort of low speed body roll, that, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about 
about low speed. Uh, likewise, when we get on the brakes and the car will start to nosedive again, that's low speed. Uh, we're talking about high speed velocities. We're talking about the undulations in the road, uh, the actual bumps and how the car will ride those bumps. And then uh, if we're looking about very high speed uh, shock movement, damp damper movement, we could be talking about where we ride a curb and the damper moves very, very quickly. Uh, the idea with this is what we're, we're looking at ideally is that we should have a nice normal distribution curve, which uh, is actually not what we've got here. We can see there's a bit of an offset between our bump and rebound sides. Uh, whereas if we look at the right front, uh, we can see that we've got what is a much more sort of uh, consistent and even normal distribution curve. So that can help us or guide us with our bump and rebound uh, damping. And a lot of dampers though, uh, what we will have is a single uh, adjuster and that will affect to a degree both our bump and rebound together. Uh, while this is useful, still a lot of this does come down to a bit of driver feedback and it's always advisable. We, we've just recently gone through this with the car, going out and doing a, a set of runs and actually checking what the car feels like and how it responds all the way from full soft through to full hard. We did this with our MCA red coilovers and it was really noticeable even as a non-professional driver. Driver. Uh, with the shocks all set to full soft, we had a car that was really wallowy, uh, didn't want to turn in, just felt like a big boat at sea really. Uh, on the flip side of that, when we went to full hard, uh, the car was was really quite unsettled over undulations, uh, it wasn't really too stable in the braking area on some corners that were a little bit bumpy, so uh, it was quite obvious, at least even for me, at both ends of the spectrum, uh, we definitely weren't we didn't have uh, damper settings that were suitable and somewhere in the mid range the car really did respond we got the, a nice combination between that crisp turn in uh, without being upset over the bumps so that's something that's really advisable to do uh, the way we did that as well is quite important because I know uh, if you turn up to your average track day it can be quite hard to to sort of make these changes we sort of make might get a, a 10 or a 20 minute session and then you might sit around for an hour and uh, to do this effectively you really want to back to back this quickly so what we were doing is going out doing an out lap, one flying lap and then come in and being really sensitive to looking for those changes under how the car behaves, uh, initial turn in through the corner, how it rides bumps, how it rides the curbs, come back in, make a change and immediately go straight back out. So this gives you the best chance, again, particularly if you're not a pro, to actually do a good back to back. All right, uh, let me head back to my notes here. Uh, now I'll just quickly, while we're talking about suspension a little bit here, uh, I will also just jump over to our Instagram and just cover quickly off, if it's going to load up here, yeah, uh, just a, a quick photo here of our MCA red coilover and there's a huge amount of misinformation and a lot of debate about the correct way to adjust our ride height. Uh, a lot of people, particularly with a coilover like this where we've got the adjustable spring platform, uh, which is uh, spring based I should say, which is what we've got here, a lot of people think that uh, the correct way of adjusting the coilover is to adjust that until we're just contacting the spring so it's captive and then make adjustments to our ride height at the the base of the damper which uh, you can't actually see here it's out of shot uh, now the the problem with doing that is that uh, if we if we do that it's actually affecting the ratio of bump to rebound travel and uh, that's prob that can be problematic so uh, the correct way of adjusting this is to start like we have here uh, with the spring actually removed and what we want to do is adjust that lower platform which I've actually lied about it's actually that one there we can see and what we want to do is adjust that so that at maximum bump travel you also see that we don't have a bump stop in, installed at the moment uh, we want to adjust that so that the wheel will not contact the bodywork or the inner fender the inner guard uh, because of course that can be dangerous so that sets our maximum bump travel and of course then we would sort of go back and refit our spring and our bump stop the bump stop there is going to absorb that last a little bit of travel and take that up progressively which is really important as well so that gives us our maximum bump travel now we then can go ahead and set our ride height but we're going to set that with our lower spring platform instead of that lower mount and generally as a good rule of thumb what we want to do is take the maximum amount of travel we've got between full bump and full rebound or full droop and we want to set it up so that from our natural ride height two thirds of the available travel is available for bump travel or compression and one third is available for rebound that's generally going to be a pretty good ballpark to get us started 
Now, of course, from their uh, individual uh, preferences on ride height, a lot of this does come down to aesthetics, but of course, ultimately, uh, if you want your car to go fast, the suspension travel has to be there. So setting the car, uh, so it's just about sitting on the bump stop, so it looks really good. Uh, great for uh, hard parking, not so great necessarily for going around the track. Right, lastly for today, I'll just quickly jump over. We've been really talking a bit about uh, race car stuff here, so I'll just continue the theme. And uh, we have got a data analysis, a couple of data analysis courses out. And a lot of people think that you're going to need to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars on uh, data analysis hardware. And what we've done is added a worked example into our data analysis fundamentals course, showing that that's actually not the case. Uh, you, there are some really good uh, apps available for your iPhone or for your Android phone, whatever phone, doesn't really matter, uh, such as Track Addict, Addict from HP Tuners. Uh, it actually does a really good job using the built-in functions of your cell phone uh, to actually do some data analysis. So if you're interested in some entry-level data analysis, you can check that out. You can find that at hpacademy.com forward slash courses and you'll scroll down through that list and you're look, looking for our data analysis fundamentals course. All right, that brings us to the end of our pre-show, so thanks for watching there. Give me a few moments and we'll get started with today's lesson. If you liked that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.